Welcome to Bitch Talk Booze and Interviews straight from the heart of San Francisco. This is Ange, and you can find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com. You can also find us every Monday morning from 6 to 6.30 a.m. on bff.fm. Right now I'm coming to you from the studio, and we have a really exciting interview with the director and co-writer of the film First Cow, Kelly Reichart. And uh, this film... is really beautifully shot. Uh, it's about the first cow being brought to the Pacific Northwest in the 1820s uh, and two unlikely friends who are trying to find their American dream. So uh, I really enjoyed talking to her. There are a lot of issues in this film that are very relatable to today, uh, which you'll hear more about in our interview. And I hope you take a listen and enjoy. I'll see you on the other side. Kelly, thank you so much for being on Bitch Talk. Oh, thanks for having me. I, I loved this film. It was a beautiful film, and, and obviously I want to dive into it. But first, I want to talk to you a little bit about your career as a filmmaker. You know, you've been making films since 1994, and you, you've talked about, you know, how there's certain gatekeepers, you know, even in the indie film world. It's sort of a, a boys club, and, and you know, not only did you not want to break into that, but you, you kind of just wanted to create your own world where you can make films on your own terms. Sort of going back to Super 8, uh, after my first feature and um, just going back, you know, finding ways to work and, uh, you know, shooting narrative on Super 8, with like a two-person crew, and then uh, then finally being able to uh, make Old Joy, on, which was shot on 16 over two weeks, um, all exteriors with a crew of, I think there was a total of six of us, mm. like four crew people and two actors and a dog. <laughs> uh, and everyone sort of gave me two weeks, and that was just meant to kind of be an art project, not really knowing what length it would be. But um, that just act because I had sort of given up on feature filmmaking by that point. But that did end up being feature length and ended up going to Sundance. And so miraculously, uh, we got some funding for Wendy and Lucy, which was a, you know, then we were a 13 person crew, all, mostly all exteriors. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, uh, you know, Michelle and the dog. And then, uh, you know, it just, I mean, every film sort of, you're like, wow, they're letting us make, we're getting to make one more. And uh, Meek's cut off. Uh, certainly thought that would be the end of the road for us. But so as it's happened, this small growing, um, I met Neil Kopp, producer here, when we made Old Joy. And at the end of that project, Anish Sojani came on, and those guys have produced all, to great credit to them, figuring out how to make these films with these budgets, which are, you know, ambitious for the what we have. Um so a lot of it's been um, teaming up with those guys and uh, sort of finding a writing partner uh, in the in the all the wonderful stories of Jonathan Raymond. And so we just sort of have uh, built our world really gradually. I've been making a lot of films with uh, Chris Blavelt, cinematographer and assistant director Chris Carroll, and um, various. Uh, costume designers that I am pals with and uh, production designers. And uh, it's just kind of uh, grown. Uh, I mean, my uh, agent was sort of just kidding me about reading something in the L.A. Times, and he was sort of saying, I don't know if you can keep having an outsider story if you're making uh, a film that was produced by Scott Rudin and put out with a- by A24, mm-hmm. which is probably true. But it still, to me, felt like, you know, I know the A24 guys from the oscilloscope days, and it still felt, you know, like we were, uh, we did have more of a budget to move around than we've had before. But it has been this, after a decade of not being able to make work, or just, you know, I mean, I did continue to always work just and to study and to uh and to teach, uh, but then to sort of have the next decade be so prolific was is not something I would have 
anticipated. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was a very sort of step by step progression. Yeah, it's been it's been a lot to take, but <laughs> I th- I think that that says a lot about you as a filmmaker and the way that you approach your storytelling and and people want that, you know, um the, it's not you you're not part of this big Hollywood blockbuster machine and people want that. There's a real craving for stories like this that are told so uniquely. That's some people do. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly you're still here, right? <laughs> but yeah, but you know, it's, 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 it's great. And, uh, it's, uh, and you know, uh, these companies that will shepherd a film like this, uh, you know, I mean, Adam Yock put in David Finkel and all the whole team at Oscilloscope, if they wouldn't have like, picked up on Wendy and Lucy and Meek's cutoff, I, it could easily all, not, you know, those films needed a lot of special shepherding into the world that just, I was so lucky a oscilloscope existed. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, it's all, uh, it all feels like a fluke, but it is nice to be able to, uh, you know, I mean, there was definitely the 90s felt very uh, not welcoming. And, uh, but it's also true that aside from the woman filmmaker thing, that it's always been hard for everybody to make small stories that mm-hmm. don't, um, you know, aren't full of melancholy and uh, or nostalgia or whatever it is that people like um, or expect from indie cinema. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's. I don't know. I, I'm very grateful that I've gotten to be so productive these last years. Mm-hmm. Well, well, we are too, coming from uh, the fil- uh, the watching standpoint of, of your films. <laughs> um, so, so now I want to take it to First Cow. Why did you think now was the time to tell this story? Well, some of it, you know, is really practical and personal, to be honest. I, I had been trying to make this film with... Uh, a writer friend of mine that was all in the early 1800s and took place in, uh, well, it took place in make-believe world, but yeah, I was scouting like Slovakia off and on for the, for a couple of years and, uh, and old villages. And that film was too much perhaps of a, a, a budget climb for me. So I, I couldn't make it happen, but, um, but I, had immersed myself so much I kind of didn't want to leave that period of time and the stories are completely dissimilar to uh the half-life which uh is what first cow came from that's Jonathan Raymond's first novel and uh and I don't know I was still I just had all these images and ideas of this period and so John's novel which we've over the years and decades have been like, how could we ever make that into a film? Because that film goes, spans 40 years and there's a big trip to China in it. And it moves between the 1980s and the early 1800s. And so I was in this 1800 mode. So we went back and looked at just that part of John's story. And it was really, um, uh, I didn't want to just sort of be extracting from a novel and not being able to have usually working off a shorter film or a novella, a shorter story or a novella where I could go in and sort of expand and be able to be creative inside it. Uh, so John came up with the idea of the cow, which does not exist in his novel. And that um, let us uh, keep a lot of the themes of the film, which seemed, I mean, the, of the novel, which seemed really, you know, it's really an immigrant story in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, also just this moment of the first moments of uh, capitalism and uh, in relation to the natural world and looking at how those things could or could not coexist, but doing it all around a super small story of these two guys and really kind of a heist film. Mm -hmm. Um, So that all... Listen, whatever topic you were to pick right now, you could 
find a relevancy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It was it was insane. I'm yeah. like, yeah. So this is a movie being told from the perspective of the 1820s. But why do I relate to all of these? <laughs> yeah. All of these, except for the one. I have to tell you, it made me really sad to think that after a good day of selling oily cakes, they can buy one acre of land in San Francisco. I, I got real I, sad I, at that concept. <laughs> I know that. Well, also they're dreamers. What do they know? You <laughs> right. Know? Yeah. Um, and the whole idea of owning land is still a new concept too. Uh, but uh, yes, that, that for the artisan uh, cake makers and coffee makers out there, that would probably uh, not yeah register. Yeah, could you imagine? No, I mean I was just like, oh, simpler times. God, that's incredible. After a good day of work, if I can real- afford dinner, I'm happy. Right, yes. <laughs> It's a, it's a film about real estate. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, you just touched on so many things that I want to elaborate on. But but first and foremost, obviously, this friendship uh, between King Lou and Cookie is it's so beautiful. It's such an organic friendship that, between the two of them. And I think it's a really important topic to think about because back then there weren't a lot of women around. So these friendships between was, men, that was their yeah. basis of intimacy. Right. Yeah, there wouldn't have been any white women in the area at the time, unless, like, maybe a translator made. I mean, like, we were trying to have, like, even with um, uh, Otis Cookie Figuit, we were like, okay, there can be one Jewish person. Um, you know, just trying to make group, for, like, there's always one of somebody. But, yeah, there was not, uh, women hadn't really made their way out here yet. So, uh People like the chief factor, the Toby Jones character, who plays the head of the uh, beaver trade, he would have. He, he's kind of modeled off John McLaughlin and the Hudson Bay, comp- the head of the Hudson Bay Company, mm-hmm. and uh, came down. You know, was British and came down from Vancouver and was going to came to exploit the land. Uh, and um, he would have had probably a Chinook wife, and he's probably got a white wife back home. Um, Mm -hmm. But so aside from the uh, First Nations women, there really wouldn't have been uh, other women here at the time. Right. And and I do love that you incorporate that into the film is is this relationship with, you know, the head of the of the fur trading and his uh, Chinook wife. And there's a really great scene with him and his wife and and the other natives. And uh, they're talking about how they don't understand how the, the white men come and and, you know, kill off all the beavers, but they don't eat the tail. It's the best part. <laughs> and so I really love, can you talk about why it was Wait. important for you to incorporate that? Um, well, yeah, just the idea of voice and the sort of, um, just the hubris of, uh, you, well, I mean, you know, the First Nations people were able to live off the land here for, you know, endless time. And, but, the beaver are going to get wiped out in, I think, like five years, as as do the all the uh, the Chinook and the uh, the local tribes in the area. It's all it's all fairly it happens really fast. There's like this moment of trade, and then it uh, and then oh, this is timely, <laughs> and yeah. then you know uh, people get sick, and uh, and so uh, just the waste. And the, uh, you know, the captain talks about uh, being sick of salmon (laughs) (laughs) and um, which is what the Multnomah tribes all, you know, lived off forever. Uh, But, um, yeah, it's there's a lot. That scene is pretty heavy duty. There's a lot going a lot of layers of things going on there. Um, uh, The uh, delivery of the. Of when, when Cookie and King Lou enter into the chief factor's house, and there's um, yeah, there's lots of lots of layers there, and I got to work with the great Lily Gladstone again, which was awesome. Yeah, I, I loved it, and I love that aspect of you know you call it a heist film. So Cookie and King Lou are you know essentially stealing milk from the cow to for their business, but you know Chief Factor is here stealing from the land (laughs) so you know who's more wrong you know what i mean because one one is deemed illegal but the other one is more hurtful in the long run so it's just that that irony of of capitalism and nature and if they can coexist together yeah the big crime is the uh 
you know, a basket of milk being stolen. But yes, there's there's larger crimes at hand that are, uh, um, yes, that are. But I don't want to give too much away. <laughs> right, I don't want to give too much away, but I do want to talk about this beautiful cow, and Cookie's relationship with the cow. I mean, the way that he speaks to the cow, and he's so gentle. Can you tell me about the relationship and and the cow in real life? I love this this beautiful cow. <laughs> Evie. Um, her name's Evie? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, her name's Evie. She came from Washington, and um, she, yeah, well, it's like having, I guess, any animals on set. It's very, uh, I don't know, just whatever. It makes everything nicer to have animals around. Mm. Yeah, she's very <laughs> beloved and got a lot of, uh, she got used to everybody because she was getting a lot of scratches behind the ear and uh she was, uh, yeah, she, and, and it, it just, uh, when you work with animals, like, it's interesting because film people are so go, 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 fast, fast, fast. But if you're working with an animal, you sort of, especially like a cow or a horse, you have to really slow down and um, not be, you know, not frighten them. And so it, it, it's fun to watch a, a whole film crew slow down and sort of become obedient to this uh, or conscious of or, you know, try to, you know, watch a whole bunch of talk about it, you know, like can be pretty dude heavy and watch everyone <laughs> like slow down because they don't want to scare the cow um, and sort of talk lower, talk softer, move in slow motion. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, and it is cool for like Magaro who plays Cookie, who, um, you know, he really, you know, he had to form a bond with her so that he could do these scenes with her. And uh, and he's just, yeah, I mean, he, it was easy for him because uh, he's uh, an animal liker. And so, <laughs> yeah, so, but uh, it's, you know, that's like a place where, sort of reality and art kind of start to mix because uh, this bond really is forming. And he had to be gentle with the cow to keep it calm anyway. Yeah. But yeah, I, I loved yeah. the scenes with him with him and the cow. Um, is he also a cook? I, I want to get into the food, obviously, the oily cakes. I'm dying to try one. Uh, John McGarrow loves cooking. He likes to cook. And he was, uh, that's sort of how he found his way into the character. I was sending him you know, old timey cookbooks like the Lewis and Clark cookbook and <laughs> these sorts of things. And, and uh, anything I could find at Powell's that would help him along. And I was sending to, and he was in his house kitchen apartment a couple months before we shot, just making all kinds of weird stuff in his house. But, um, but so yeah, that was a, a, that was kind of a way in for him. And then uh, Orion Lee, who came from London, they, those guys, met in Oregon and got in their costumes and got shipped off on, uh, with a survivalist into the woods, into the rainy woods. I think they were there for four days, just learning how to do some of the basic stuff that they have to do in the film, like uh, set the traps and uh, some cooking things uh, and building fire without matches and all those things. Mm. And then the and then the prop department was really the oily cake department. John and McGarrow and uh, one of our prop guys, Sean Fong, they made a lot of they made a lot of oily cakes. Yeah, I was gonna say. So were you guys just eating oily cakes every day? Yeah. <laughs> You're like, that's a wrap. <laughs> yeah, no, they were. A lot of people were oily cakes and wrap ears, but I, <laughs> I mean, it's fried bread. I, I have to stay healthy on a film. I can't be indulging in oily cakes but many <laughs> many a did yeah many people did but um yeah well I really like how you've managed to take this world that we associate with being you know the wild west these shootouts these crazy times but you've you've really focused on life life in the margins and the calmer side of it I mean there's there's sort of danger lurking around but the um sort of crazy masculine energy i mean in one way the lack of women and all just you know it's just like maybe that's why everyone's fighting all the time uh <laughs> they, you know so so that what is usually the sort of forefront 
in the Western, um, all the sort of hyper-masculine toughness is sort of pushed to the margins. But there is a, uh, is you know, it is, these are like some sort of fragile people in a dangerous place mm-hmm. and trying to um, figure a way to get by and on their wits as opposed to their muscle, um, which is, isn't really an option for them. So, yeah, it's it's the dangerous sort of lingering on the edges, but uh, the fighting becomes quite comical, actually. Uh, yeah, you do like kind of make them seem like Three Stooges, like the, the fur trappers. Yeah. <laughs> the bong, bing, bong. Yeah, we, I, it's the, we kept calling the trappers the Muppets. <laughs> like, all right, the Muppets have to fight again. Yeah. <laughs> like, let's get going. <laughs> they were such a good group of guys. They were the opposite of tough guys. <laughs> it was mm-hmm. really sweet. Well, well, thank you so much for being here, Kelly. I really enjoyed the oh, film. And, so and, I, and I can't wait to see what you do next. So thank you so much. Oh, God, thanks for the support and encouragement. I really appreciate it. That was my interview with director and co-writer of First Cow, Kelly Reichart. Uh, I really, I was glad that we got to talk about uh, a, a lot of the issues that this film touched on. It was kind of, it's hard because, you know, obviously we are in very troubling times, <laughs> which you could say at any point in life, but um, things are on a, a new level of strange these days. Um, but the the topics that this film touches on, you know, race, class, capitalism, immigration, they all touch really, really close to home. Um, so I'm really glad that this story is out there and, and hopefully you'll watch and, and you'll be able to to see what I'm saying and, and relate to a lot of these issues. I mean, particularly, you know, this was in the 1820s. Society was still being formed, but capitalism was already screwing this country up, essentially, <laughs> even in its inception. Um, so it's an interesting concept of uh, what's inherent in us uh, and and um, what what comes of this these Wild West years. Uh, but I'm really grateful to have Kelly Reichardt sit down with me and, and take the time. And I hope you go out and enjoy this film, support your indie filmmakers. So uh, don't forget to check us out on bitchtalkpodcast.com. You can also find us at 6 to 6.30 a.m. at bff.fm. And this is Ange signing out. We're powered by GoTo Productions. Bitch, please.